morning and welcome to the seventh meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members uh, to turn off their mobile phones and members of the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item four in private. Are members agreed? Our second item of business today is an evidence session on the Article 50 negotiations and the UK's future trade policy in particular. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the witnesses today. Uh, uh, I'd like to welcome Peter Ung Pakorn, uh, the former Senior Information Officer of the World Trade Organisation Secretariat, uh, Dr Grazia Marin Duran, uh, Senior Lecturer in International Economic Law uh, at the UCL Faculty of Laws, University College London. Uh, uh, Dr. Matthias Margulis, Senior Lecturer in Polit Political Economy at the University of Stirling, and Liz Murray, Head of Scottish Campaigns at Global Justice Now. Uh, welcome. Um, I'd also like to remem remind members and witnesses that time is short and we have a lot of ground to cover, so if questions and answers could be as brief as possible, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, there's a great deal of ground to cover, um, and I'd perhaps like to start, maybe approach it chronologically, and look at the uh, proposed transition uh, period uh, first. Um, the EU Council guidelines on transition propose that the UK continue to participate in the customs union uh, and the single market. Um, is the UK likely to get agreement um, from the EU and third countries uh, to continue participating in the EU's own free trade agreements with those third countries because my understanding and this is brought out in other evidence sessions of other committees uh, that some of the third countries may uh, object to continuing uh, uh, the relationship with the with the UK because the UK is no longer a legal party to the treaty that they've signed with the EU and I wondered what your opinion was on that concern. Yes. 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 Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know the, entirely how the legal aspects of that would work. Um, I've read and, and, and heard people talk about other countries wanting to try and improve the um, conditions that they have under, under free trade agreements. In other words, they would see it as an opportunity to gain more. Um, from, from the UK be because of this. I don't necessarily see it that way. I think that this is about countries trying to preserve the trading rights that they have at the moment um, in a new context, in the context of, of, of the UK separating from, from the EU. Um, and provided both sides understand that and, and, and are willing to negotiate in good faith, I would have thought that it is possible to do that. The real question is, is how quickly and whether it can be done within two years. Um, and that depends on a number of things. It depends on, I mean, there's a lot of work that will be involved in, in, in taking over these free trade agreements, rolling them over, grandfathering, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of work there and it depends on, on the resources and how stretched um, the UK and other countries are in, in, in the negotiations. That, that would be my... Yeah. I, I, I guess my question um, was not so much about the grandfathering, which is an yes. uh, important area to explore as well, uh, but actually what happens within the transition period, because my understanding was that while the UK would be bound during the transition period, the third countries would not necessarily be bound during the transition period. They would have to give their agreement, yes, I would think so. Right. Uh, gra uh, Grazia? Uh, the legal answer to that, so politically they might object, but the legal answer to that, in my opinion, is that it will depend from agreement to agreement. But some agree, most of the most recent uh, EU FTAs, such as CETA, for instance, with Canada, the territorial application of that agreement is to any territory where the EU treaties apply. So insofar as the EU treaties will continue to apply during the transition period to the UK, legally speaking, these FTAs will also apply because the UK will continue to be a territory in which the EU treaties applies. Yeah? So you have to look at agreement per agreement, but most of the 
recent agreements, including Canada, which is obviously one of the uh, most important ones for the UK, given the current trade flows, mm -hmm. they apply not only to the EU and its member states, but also any other territory where the EU treaties apply. And that will be the case of the UK during the transition period. So I think during the transition period, there is legally no problem. Yeah, these agreements will continue to apply. The question is whether, whether during this short transition period yeah, of two years or less than two years, uh, the UK will first have the capacity to renegotiate these agreements yeah, in practical terms, but also the legal capacity because of what I've just said, that the EU treaties continue to apply. Yeah? This means the UK will still be bound by the EU common commercial policy, yeah? which is an, a new exclusive competence, as we know. And if you look at the Commission withdrawal, draft withdrawal agreement from February 2018, it is a bit ambiguous whether the UK, given the common commercial policy, is an exclusive competence of the European Union, yeah? So only the European Union has the power to negotiate agreements, will have the capacity to negotiate agreements during this two years period. It will definitely not have the capacity to conclude any agreements, yeah? because this is an area of exclusive competence. Uh, but whether it will have the capacity to negotiate, I think this is something that needs to be clarified a little bit further, because in the current withdrawal, draft withdrawal agreement, although it's only Article 124, it is a bit ambiguous. It says the UK cannot conclude any new uh, international trade agreements during this period unless it is authorized to do so by the European Union, because this is an area of exclusive competence. Yeah. So it's, it's the question of whether physically it is possible yeah, within two years, given the short time, but also legally, yeah, whether they will have the capacity to negotiate and conclude something uh, in an area which will continue to be an area of exclusive competence of the European Union during these two years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes. And it has been reported in the press this morning that that agreement has been secured and will be part of the, the, the outcome of discussions taking place next week. Rough withdrawal agreement? That the, the, the United Kingdom has secured permission to undertake negotiations to, uh, in relation to new trade agreements uh, during the transition period. That, that's being reported this morning. Um, that's what is being reported, but the draft withdrawal agreement does not say that. And I think that will be a point worth clarifying in the actual agreement. If, if one reads Article 124 of that draft withdrawal agreement, it says the UK will not be able to become bound by any new agreement. Bound does not mean he cannot negotiate it, but he can definitely not conclude it during these two year periods unless it is empowered to do so by the European Union. Because this is an area of EU exclusive competence. Only the EU has the competence yeah, to negotiate and conclude international agreements in the field of trade. So I think that article of the, is, is worth clarifying. Yeah. Uh, not only that it is reported, but that it's actually yep. in the agreement. But that will be part of the negotiation, and it's just it's being reported that it, as the outcome of the negotiation, in other words, the transition arrangement that is properly agreed, that, 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 that there does seem to have been progress in relation to that. Maybe. Well, the text that I have seen doesn't say that so clearly. So. Well, not yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On, on taking, taking things uh, forward, I wanted to ask about the tariff rate quotas. Uh, and that the, in October, the, the EU and the UK proposed that uh, the future EUs, excluding the UK and the UK's uh, TRQs, would be calculated by apportioning the EU's existing commitments. Um, but and we know that uh, a number of countries have written to the WTO expressing concern about that. I wonder if you could say something a little bit about that and how that's likely to be resolved, if at all. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak today. Um, yeah, so in, um, a, as you know, uh, several members, including uh, the US and Canada, raised some concerns about the proposed method that the uh, EU and the UK have proposed to split up their tariff rate quotas. Um, and I think from this, we can sort of gather three points. The first is that th they're unhappy with the current method, which is a technical matter. 
Uh, but second, um, it was quite clear that there was a concern about losing what uh, they view as the full value of the TRQ um, as a larger point, and that they also made it clear that this was not, not going to be possible through technical rect rectification. This will have to be approved by all WTO members. So I think it's a clear signal from WTO members that there's a line in the sand, that a technical option is no longer on the table, and this will be open to uh, membership approval. So I think that introduces several uh, issues that need to be taken into account. A, um, A, what the new method will be, how W2 members will be consulted along the way as they want input into this process. Uh, and it also the broader question of um, will just splitting up the existing TRQs be sufficient or will the UK or the EU or both have to offer something in addition uh, to get WTO member agreement. So I think it's turned out to be a lot more complicated than was originally assumed. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And my final question relates to when, um, when Grazia and uh, Matthias were here before, it's quite a long time, so it must be well over a year since you gave evidence to the committee. But I recall at that time we were talking about the UK's, um, the UK's letter um, to the car industry suggesting that they would be okay in future uh, trade deals uh, and more recently we've we've had the prime minister in her mansion house speech talking about what has been described as a pick and mix approach to regulations they'll adopt some regulations and not others um, for different sectors and i just wondered if you were able to share anything uh, with us on what your views are on that particular speech and the idea that that recognition and mutual recognition could could be picked and mixed? I think there is a little bit of a misunderstanding in the way that mutual recognition is normally put in this, in this debate. Um, the fact that you don't um, engage in mutual recognition does not mean you will not have to comply with the regulations. You'll have to comply with the regulations anyway. There is no way of exporting to the European Union free of EU regulation. This is just a paradigm that doesn't exist. If you want to, co to export to the European Union agricultural products, you have to comply with the relevant product standards. If you want to export cards, you will have to comply with the relevant standards. Mutual recognition simply means that your regulation will be automatically be considered compatible yeah, with theirs. That's what it means. Uh, whether it makes sense to Pick and, I mean, yes, you can pick and choose, yeah, whether, whether, whether you uh, have an, an understanding of mutual recognition in certain sectors as opposed to others. I, this is feasible, uh, legally speaking. Uh, whether it makes sense, I'm not sure, because the fact is not that if you have no mutual recognition, you will not have to comply with your regulation. You will always have to comply. Any country that exports to the EU has to comply with whatever regulation is in place for the products concerned or the services concern. Yeah? Mutual recognition just means that this process is made easier because your own regulations will be automatically recognized as compatible with EU ones, in the same way they are now in the internal market. Yeah? But, so I'm, it is possible to pick and choose whether it makes sense, I'm not sure, because mutual recognition just facilitates the process of having to comply in any event. Right. Okay. Okay, I'll pass on to Claire Baker now. Thank you. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to ask some questions around establishing the UK's position at the WTO, which will need to be a renegotiated um, position. And I suppose we're interested in where you think WTO members might push for concessions from the UK, where the particular areas might be. There have been some questions raised around the cap payments in the future of those under renegotiated terms. So I'm just interested in where the pressure points might be in those discussions. Um, I think TRQs are the, are the biggest problem um, for technical reasons. Um, it's not necessarily, as I said before, it's not necessarily a question of countries seeking concessions, but trying to protect what they consider to be the value of access, as, as Matthias said just now. Um, with, with tariff quotas, you have, you have a quota at the moment, say 100,000 tonnes of whatever product, and you can export that to anywhere in the, in the EU. If you split the UK and the EU 27, then the fluidity, the freedom to be able to export to, to the whole 
to any part to choose whether this year you're going to export to Germany or next year export to the UK. You lose that. And that's what their objection is about tariff quotas. It's about whether, uh, how, you, how they can preserve what they consider to be the commercial value of the access to, to those tariff quotas. There is also a very technical issue that's come up that nobody thought about because conceptually it's simple. You have 100,000 tonnes quota of something. You say 30% of that goes to the UK, 70% of that goes to the EU. You split it that way. That's the, the approach of the, the common approach of the UK and the EU. It turns out that there's no data, no re reliable data for that because the tariff quotas are defined at a very detailed level in terms of how the products are de defined. But the consumption data, which is how you know how much of that product has ended up in the UK or how much of that product has ended up in the EU, is much broader. So taking, say, a figure for, for a broad category like beef and then trying to say, well, for a particular type of beef, high quality beef or whatever it is, saying that is the same ratio, it's still 30-70, there is a problem with that. And, and delegates told me that the UK and the EU actually suggested to them, to people like New Zealand or Australia, if your industry has got better figures than ours, we'd like to hear them. And this has taken, actually taken months for the UK to, to eat, just to come up with, the, and the EU to come up with, with figures for that. For the cap, for, for the... Um, subsidies, we're only talking about um, what are called trade distorting subsidies. Those are directly related to prices and production. Um, the EU currently, the whole of the EU currently only uses around 8% of its entitlement. So th the actual trade distorting type of subsidy within, within the entitlement is, is quite small. So there's a lot of room for maneuver. And I personally don't see that that this is going to be a problem in the WTO of, of dividing how much of that should be the, the UK's entitlement, how much of that should be the EU's entitlement, because you've got over 90% of, of unused um, entitlement, which, which is a huge room for manoeuvre. So if that does become a problem, then it su suggests that there is quite a lot of ill will in the negotiations, which hopefully people would avoid. Um, the other area... Um, the other area where, where there will need to be um, decisions on, on, on how to deal with the UK's commitments is services. Um, that's fairly straightforward. I would have thought it's time-consuming. A lot of things that we say are straightforward are actually time-consuming because there's a lot of detail. But it ought to be fairly easy to, to identify what the commitments of the UK are extracted from those of the EU. And f but finally, there's also um, government procurement, where there are also commitments in the WTO. And the issue there is that unlike with the, the other areas of work in the WTO, where the UK also signed on as the UK, as well as the EU, uh, the government procurement agreement was only signed by the EU. So there's go going to have to be some legal way of dealing with that so that the UK can, can um, have its own commitment separate from the EU. Um, this is probably my, my lack of knowledge, but if you maybe in the next part of the reply and explain, when you talk about the 8% being used and over 90% left in flexibility, yes. why there's such a large amount that's... Is it not a common... It's just to have a better understanding of why it's such a small proportion of what could be available. But the other question that maybe links to that is around state aid. Um, and when... You know, discussions around leaving the EU are had, often it's, it's maybe argued that the trade deals we have are too restrictive. And within the Parliament, you know, we've discussed um, the restrictions that state aid gives us. And we've talked about film studios or about our um, industri industry base, um, where if we were able to have government intervention, that could be positive. But an argument's always made that state aid restricts us from doing so. Um, does the situation, is there any room for manoeuvre here? It suggests that under WTO membership there would still be um, restrictions around state aid. Would they be to the same extent or are they likely to be more flexible? As I understand it, the European Union changed the type of support it was giving to agriculture, what, what in the WTO is called domestic support, from 
coupled payments, payments that are directly related to production and prices, to decoupled payments, which are, are sort of fixed and, and, and not related to how much the farmer produces in, in each year. There were a number of reasons of, for that, partly to do with the budget, partly because I think the EU was anticipating an outcome in the WTO agriculture negotiations which would have reduced um, countries' entitlements. Um, that didn't happen, but the EU has gone ahead and done that anyway. And, and so that's the reason why the EU is only using around 8% of, of, of its entitlement for domestic support. I don't, I'm not an expert on state aid, I, um, but as far as the WTO is concerned, I think the restrictions are mainly to do with whether the state aid has an impact on exports. And if it's aid in general, the WTO would be silent on that. Yeah, just, just to clarify that, on state aid, EU rules are far more restrictive than WTO ones for two reasons, just very simple. First of all, there is a general prohibition on state aid. In general, you cannot, unless you are authorised by the Commission to do so. That's the rule, basic rule in the EU. In the WTO, you're not generally prohibited from providing state aid or subsidies, as they call them there, only subsidies that affect exports, that are contingent on export, only certain types of subsidies are prohibited, but there is no general prohibition. And in particular, you don't have to be authorised to provide the other subsidies by anyone. You provide them, and then if other members think there is a problem, they challenge you. Yeah? But you don't have to seek a priori authorization from any entity in the WTO. So they're far more flexible yeah? in terms of the lack of a general prohibition, but also the monitoring no or supervision of state aid. Okay, thank you. I'll just uh, I can add a couple of uh, quick points. Um, I, just, I think just to the, back to the, uh, I think this sort of came back to the original question about the types of concessions. So I think things to keep in mind here also relate to, um, Peter was saying about, um, it also depends on the kind of signals the UK is going to put out about what it's likely to offer um, and what it's likely, for example, to set its tariffs at post-EU. Uh, Will it keep the same tariffs it currently has um, as the EU, or will it lower them slightly? Um, and all this is going to change how other members perceive the, whether the value of their existing arrangements are being diminished or not. So I think this, this issue of diminishment of what exists on the table is really how other countries are looking at it. And, and that will be li largely defined by the future UK-EU relationship, which we don't know what that looks like yet. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I think on the agreement of government procurement, it might be interest uh, for the members here um, to recognize that in the schedules, for example, for subnational, uh, many, for example, many Scottish uh, institutions are listed there as, as, um, as open to the uh, agreement. So it might be a worthwhile exercise for, um, for members or, or, and their staff to look at which specific Scottish uh, institutions, for example, like so Scottish Enterprise, are currently in the agreement? Are there other types of institutions they may want to add uh, in a future, um, a, uh, a revised or uh, schedule in the future for the UK when it joins uh, individually? So I think these are the kind of maybe issues to consider here at a Scottish level. Thank you. Thank you. Ross Crean. Thank you, uh, convener. Thank you, convener. The European Parliament passed quite an interesting resolution yesterday on the terms of a future UK-EU um, trade relationship, particularly in relation to tax, and I'm just going to make sure that I get them right. Um, the resolution made clear that any future trade deal must be dependent on UK adherence to EU standards on taxation, including anti-money laundering legislation, exchange of information, anti-tax avoidance measures, and must address the situation of its overseas territories. Now, that's a combination of the UK must continue adhering to rules we currently adhere to as an EU member state, but also proposals for changes that we would have to make from the status quo. I'm wondering how is that? That seems relatively normal uh, for the EU to make such demands when it's negotiating trade deals. What impact do you think that will have on the negotiation of the future relationship? It's not my area of expertise, so I defer to colleagues. Do you want me to answer? I mean, as you say, that's something to be expected uh, uh, from the EU. The EU uh, will be concerned uh, in the future trade relationship about the, what they call a, a, a um, race to the bottom, not only in terms of taxation, but also in terms of uh, social legislation or environmental legislation, where the third country will lower standards in order to obtain uh, unfair, unfair from their perspective, whether it is unfair or not, it's open to discussion competitive advantage. This has been a concern with all 
the countries with which it has concluded a, a free trade agreement, and it will be with the UK as well. Yeah. Um, so these demands, not only in terms of taxation, but also social standards and environmental standards, the fact that the UK will have to adhere to certain minimum standards and not lower them in order to obtain an advantage in trade or attract foreign direct investment are closest that the, EU, that the EU will surely demand from the UK because it's been already demanding it from other countries such as uh, Canada or Korea with which it has concluded free trade agreements. Even though it trades less with these countries than it currently trades with the UK. Yeah? The UK remains one of the EU main trading partners as well. Yeah? So the more economically interdependent, the higher the EU demands are going to be in terms of keeping the level playing field just as it is now, if you want, in terms of regulation. Obviously, the UK's overseas tax haven territories are relatively unique and come from our particular uh, history. Are there any comparable relationships between the EU and any other third countries where those third countries have their own overseas territories with similar tax haven re reputations? I wouldn't know. So it would be realistic to assume that in the event of this trade deal being negotiated, it would be dependent on the, s the status of our, our current overseas territories yeah. in relation to tax changing quite significantly to bring them in line. Because my, my understanding is at the moment, these territories have been able to continue operating in the way they have because the UK is an EU member state, but they mm. are not part of the EU. Uh, the UK being a third country in an agreement with the EU would mean that the territories would have to come in line as well. Yeah, but I don't think we have a comparable situation because all the overseas territories will be overseas of, of the other member states. So it mm. wouldn't really, not, not with a third country with which the EU has currently a free trade agreement, a non-member. I can't think of an example right now, sorry of a comparable situation. The only comparable situations I can think of is of other member states, but that obviously doesn't help. Thank you. Hey, Richard. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd just like to raise the issue of timescales and capacity for these negotiations, which you may have some views on, because it strikes me that in the context of what you've said about the two-year transition and then concluding deals after that, uh, and at the same time you have to negotiate with the EU as well about the continuing relationship with the EU, never mind the rest of the trade agreements with the rest of the world. Can you give me your views on, does the UK government have the capacity for all this, and how long do you think it may take? Because presumably big countries like the US, it could potentially take years. It has taken years for the European Union to negotiate all these agreements. As an entity that has uh, an inbuilt capacity for the last, I mean, uh, commercial policy became an exclusive competence of the Union already in the 70s, which means the EU has about 40 years of experience in negotiating EU trade agreements on behalf of an ever-growing trading bloc, which gives it also a lot of bargaining power vis-a-vis uh, -vis third countries. Uh, whether the UK can achieve all this in two years, I have doubts also because, as I think we've been saying, every other negotiation very much depends on what is negotiated with the EU. Yeah? All the other third countries, whether it is for their bilateral free trade agreements, yeah? uh, what they will expect or want to change or not will very much depend on what the UK and the EU actually negotiate because their terms of trade will affect the terms of trade of everyone else. Yeah? Uh, this assuming the UK leaves the custom union. If the UK stays in the custom union, then there is no problem. Things will stay as they are. Yeah? But that's no longer an option, it seems. Yeah? So assuming they leave the custom union, what they negotiate will impact everyone else. Uh, both bilaterally, the free trade agreements, as well as the negotiations in the WTO over the tariff rate quotas. Because as Matthias was saying, this is no longer a technical change. Yeah? This requires the involvement of uh, the other WTO members, as it's been recognized by the UK and the EU in this joint letter, yeah, that at least these tariff rate quotas will require negotiations in the WTO, or active engagement, as they call it. Um, and the question I think here is, besides how you redistribute it between them, is that obviously these tariff quotas at the moment, they work in a way that they do not include exports from the EU to the UK, and vice versa. Yeah? They do not include intra-EU trade of agricultural products. Yeah. So exports to the EU to the UK and exports of the UK to the EU are currently excluded from the tariff rate quotas. These tariff rate quotas are only towards third countries, US, but those that have raised the objections mainly. Yeah. 
what will happen post-Brexit? Will the EU also have access to this? I mean, imagine we agree on a formula on how to divide them, yeah? 50% UK, 50% EU, just to make things easier, yeah? 50-50, yeah? Will the EU also have access to this 50%? Because the EU now becomes a third country in the WTO. And vice versa, will the UK have access to the 50% in the EU shadow? I think this is one of their concerns. So that is the, 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 the problem, yeah? That I think is, A, the time is limited. The capacity is also limited because the EU has been doing all this on behalf, not only of the UK, but of every other member for the last 40 years. But it's also the fact that every other negotiation depends on what the EU and the UK agree first. So, yeah, it's challenging. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, so I, I think this capacity issue, ha, it, 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 I think it cuts in two ways. I think both there is this issue of bargaining capacity, to what extent can the UK develop capacity to bargain, agree, revise current agreements and negotiate new ones. And the second is the sort of implementation burden that comes along with taking over um, a lot of the uh, current uh, practices and regulatory work that the EU Commission does. So I think it's, I think the, the, um, the amount of resources that need to be pumped in are, are quite substantial um, just to operate a baseline of, of capacity. Um, whether um, the UK can pursue a highly ambitious agenda in the short term, I think, is, isn't probably very realistic only because of the, of the learning curve and that you have to get people in to learn the job and that cannot be done in two years. As Peter was saying, it takes them three, four months to get some figures on tariff rate quotas. Um, that gives you a sense of the scale of speed of things work. So two years seems uh, pretty optimistic. Even less, than two years. Yeah. Even less than two years from I mean, March 2019, 31st of December 2020, that's not even two years. I, I would agree. I, mm. think, I think that the experience of, of watching negotiations is that something unexpected always comes up that delays things. Uh, just one short supplementary. The expertise the UK has for negotiations may be limited to UK citizens who work for the European Commission, who therefore have got experience of negotiating as part of working for the European Commission. During the transition period, will they be obliged to continue to work for the EU, <laughs> or will the UK government be able to call them back to be part of the UK's negotiating team? Otherwise, I can't see how the UK can have a negotiating team. There is something about that on the withdrawal agreement. What will be the status and, and, uh, of, of current officials of the European Union or the Parliament or so on, UK officials? I haven't read them in detail, so I won't, but there is an attempt to regulate that uh, there. Uh, but one should also not forget that some of these UK nationals have applied for memberships, um, no, sorry, not membership, nationality of other member states and obtain it. I, I used to be a EU trade negotiator, so some of my former co UK colleagues uh, have applied for Belgium or, you know, it's not very difficult in a way. It, it's pretty much an individual choice whether they want to come back or not, because if they don't want to come back, I think it's not really possible to force them because they can still apply during the transition period for the nationality of Belgium or Luxembourg or, you know. I mean, they've been resident there for many years already if they've been working for the commission and simply say, well, I'm Belgium now, I stay here as a Belgian, you, you see what I mean? So forcing them back, I think is difficult, but I agree with you, a, a lot of the EU capacity are very good, great UK trade negotiators and lawyers currently negotiating for the EU or defending the EU in the WTO, yeah. L last week, the um, Permanent Secretary of the Department of Inter International Trade, Antonia Rom Romeo, and her number two, Crawford Faulkner, were asked this question in, about the capacity in, in the Public Affairs Committee of the House of Commons. And um, they gave fairly detailed answers. And, and what Crawford Faulkner actually said about what is needed for negotiations is, is quite interesting to hear. So I would suggest that's also worth looking at. But they, I mean, to, the, 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 the bottom line was that they felt that they had enough people and they were training them well enough. Yeah. And Crawford Faulkner's own experience um, w would help with that, as far as the Department of International Trade is concerned. Do you see that? Yeah. Thank you very much, Rachel Hamilton. Actually, sorry to 
go on about tariff rate quotas, um, but it's an interesting subject because clearly it's going to affect, affect agriculture around the world. Um, wouldn't the UK be able to benefit from some of the um, third country trade deals that are currently uh, in discussion or have happened with the EU in terms of agriculture? And, and surely it's just a political um, point. It's a protectionism point uh, from each country. But So there's two points here. We can either replicate or replace those trade deals with third countries that the EU currently have, or um, should we just do you believe in terms of agriculture, do what Norway's done and take that out of trade negotiations and then separately uh, negotiate free trade agreements out with of Europe, if you see what I mean? Legal, again, purely legally speaking, the tariff rate quotas that you are currently committed uh, to provide in the WTO, you cannot really take them out. I mean, that's... That's bound in the schedule. The question is how much you going which share are you gonna take from the EU? Yeah. And I agree with Matthias in that sense. This is no longer something the EU and the UK can agree bilaterally, because that's not only a technical change, yeah, that affects other countries. So they will have to engage into negotiations uh, with at least these countries that are currently benefiting with the tariff rate quotas. Yeah. Uh, so that I don't think can be taken out completely, yeah? The, the ones that you are committed in the WTO. Um, the free trade agreements concessions, yeah? That, yes, that can be uh, uh, withdrawn completely because that is something that will be subject uh, uh, um, uh, to negotiations. Um, of course, you know, you can say closing your market might make sense for you, but if you do so, this also means the third country will close your market, uh, their market, sorry, for UK exports, whether it is in agriculture or other sectors. Whether overall it makes sense, that's not an assessment I can make. Yeah, but I mean, trade negotiations go both ways. Yeah, if I take something away from you, then the other countries will want to rebalance concessions somewhere else. Whether it is in agriculture, if they are export, if if you are exporting a lot of agriculture products to them, or whether it is in another sector. Yeah, so. The, the balance of concessions in free trade agreements will be reopened for negotiations. Yeah? You can put more in or take something out. Mm -hmm. yeah? But that allows the third country to do exactly the same. Yeah? The more you demand, the more they will demand, and vice versa. Can I elaborate a bit on what Gracia said? I think that we, we have to distinguish between two activities. One activity is preserving the legal status quo. And that's what's happening with, with the schedules of commitments in the WTO, including the TRQs. Um, and, and what has emerged is that the concept of status quo is actually a little bit more complicated than it sounded because it's not just a question necessarily of splitting up existing quantities, but also we have this no, now have this notion of the value of market access and, and, and the commercial value. So that will be, should be a fairly simple comparatively simple exercise, um, in, at least in the sense that it need not become too political. The other part of it is whether you actually want to change that status quo. When Gracia said you can't take tariff quotas out of the WTO, that's true in one sense, in the sense that the quota which gives a low tariff, you can't remove that because th that, that is a commitment. You can take tariff quotas out of the WTO by saying that low tariff will apply across the board without limits. That's possible. But you, you can do that through commitments in the WTO, or you can do that unilaterally. There's nothing to... Mm. Even if you've got a tariff quota of 100,000 tonnes at, at duty-free, you can say, well, we just unilaterally expand that, and you will not be violating your WTO commitments because you are less protectionist than you were. And in the WTO, you can always be less protectionist than the commitment you made in the WTO. But then there are other questions. I mean, you mentioned Norway. Norway may have taken agriculture out of um, the, the relationship with the EU in, in some respects. Norway and Switzerland, if you look at OECD figures, are the two most protectionist countries in the world in agriculture. So is that a good model to follow, necessarily? Okay, thank you. 
how much power will uh, the UK have to negotiate these trade agreements outside the EU? After the transition period? Yeah. Full power. Full autonomy. Okay. Yeah. But in terms of the, oh. the balance when you were describing the, the, the actual negotiation process, you know, how, how as, a, as a negotiator outside a block, how much power will the UK have? And to get a good deal from the different countries? Well, in my view, although I might be wrong, clearly less than now. And that is because, I mean, if we look at the, at, at the concessions that are made in those free trade agreements, yeah? And imagine we want to reopen everything for renegotiation, yeah? We don't want to leave them as they are, we want to reopen them. Those concessions from a third country perspective, they were not negotiated with the UK market. They were negotiated with a market where if you exported anything to the UK and it crossed the United Kingdom border, it had access automatically to a country of 27 members, to a market of 27 countries, sorry. Yeah. That value is lost now. Now it's just the UK market. Yeah. So the value of those concessions, any concession in those schedule, has tremendously changed from a third country perspective. Yeah. Because now if I'm exporting my bananas from Ecuador to the UK, I no longer can automatically access the whole of the EU market. Yeah? So from a third country perspective, this has, has changed. And I think you can expect them to, to, to demand to review these concessions accordingly. Because those concessions were made to the UK under the assumption yeah, that anything exported to the UK will have automatic access to the European Union. Now, if the UK leaves the custom union, as it seems they will, yeah, this is lost. Yeah? And that's a loss also from a third country perspective. Okay, thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, uh, Peter, a few moments ago, uh, you said that uh, uh, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of, kind of the wider uh, political context, that some things will happen, then it'll have a change. Um, in terms of the, the wider um, trade negotiations and, uh, and trading operations post-Brexit. Uh, uh, how important uh, is, the, is the wider geopolitical situation in terms of the UK's position uh, trying to negotiate trade agreements? How long have you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you think, I mean, perhaps the most difficult um, thing to look at at the moment is the possibility of, of a UK-US free trade agreement. Can anybody tell what US trade policy is at the moment and, and what they would negotiate with the UK? It, it is just very, very complicated. We don't know. Um, I would add a little bit to what Gracia said just now, with, with the question about the, the power of the UK to negotiate with other people. It, it is complicated, but I would agree with people who've said that the, U, the UK's power to negotiate with other countries as a member of the EU is greater than as the UK on its own. Because if you look at a country like India, it wants to export to 28 countries and is going to give priority to negotiating with 28 countries or if it becomes 27, rather than one unless there's a particular product that it is particularly interested in selling to the UK market. Um, that's a generalization. There will be differences in product areas and, and in countries and so on. Um, but, but Matthias may, may have an opinion on this. I would have thought that, that Canada would be more interested in, in, <laughs> in, in a good deal with the EU, with CETA, rather than, 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 than a Canada-UK deal. I think the only thing I, I, I can add to this is, I mean, I, I agree with all the previous comments, and uh, I think the pickle the, the, um, the UK has put itself in is that it has, it has publicly said it wants to negotiate many agreements as quickly as possible. Uh, very few countries do that because they know you want to sequence these out, you want to spread these out over time, you can only handle so many agreements. So I think the fact that um, the UK has put itself in a position where it said we are willing to take deals as quickly as possible um, puts them in a situation where they will also just have less bargain leverage because the political imperative is much greater on the UK end to negotiate these agreements than for other countries. In terms of the broader geopolitical issues, in addition to the 
um, unknown uh, U.S. trade policy in this direction at the moment. There are questions about um, the future of the WTO, um, the future of TPP, uh, now that it seems to be uh, back on. So there's, there's, there's a lot of movement, um, some, which, some which suggests, you know, uh, in some areas tra uh, free trade integration is picking up again. In other areas, um, things might be in reverse. So it, it's, a very, it's a very unstable time in the global trading environment and the geopolitical environment. And the UK is partly contributing to that instability, which I think is also important to remember. The UK has introduced instability into the global market through Brexit, and that will have consequences down the road that um, are unforeseen, but might change how other countries view the, the relationship with the UK and also the speed at which they may want to enter an agreement with the UK. Does anyone else have a... I just wanted to add a, a comment. Sometimes, because of these expressions of grandfathering or rolling over or so on, there is, uh, uh, I have at least a sense that uh, uh, the feeling is being created that the UK has to retain all these 40 or 50 or free trade agreements that the EU currently has with her countries. Well, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Yeah. After the transition period, it can come out of them, and the UK will trade with these countries on WTO terms. Yeah. Well, you'll tell me, well, WTO terms are obviously worse than the ones that you have in a free trade agreement. You conclude in a free trade agreement precisely to go better than the WTO. That's correct. But given all the challenges that we are discussing in terms of capacity, yeah, is it really wise in less than two years to try to renegotiate 50 free trade agreements? Given also, if you look, I mean, I'm not an economist, but if you look at the UK trade flows with the rest of the world that we have in this briefing document, yeah, that we were given, that was prepared by the committee, other than with the European Union, what are your trade flows with the rest of the world? And does it really make sense for you to renegotiate quickly the agreement with Canada when your trade flows now are up less than 1.6% of your exports? to renegotiate that quickly in two years and get a bad deal for 1% of your exports. I think that needs to be thought. Yeah, there is the, the idea, I mean, there is no obligation for the UK to retain these 50 free trade agreements in place after the transition period. During the transition period, yes, because you will continue to apply. The, but I think during the transition period, the UK should take that time, given the limited capacity and the limited time, yeah, to rethink which of these free trade agreements are worth retaining, yeah? Or whether maybe for 1% or less of your trade with these third countries, you're better off trading, you know, in the WTO for the time being, and then want, with more time and capacity, perhaps engage in a free trade agreement negotiations. That's just a suggestion, yeah? There is no obligation to roll over. Liz, do you have any comments? Um, I don't have anything on the technical side, but to link it to the trade bill, which I uh, obviously there is going through or will have to go through a process of legislative consent here, that would be, um, you know, speaking on behalf of Global Justice Now and um, as part of the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition, that would be one of the reasons why we're suggesting that um, the trade bill needs to be amended to include some levels of parliamentary scrutiny. Um, because there will be <clears throat> those, it's not included, the UK government is saying it's not included in the bill at the moment because those, their belief is that those trade third party deals will be cut and pasted and n n there's no need therefore for parliamentary scrutiny. But um, certainly listening to the evidence that was given to the public, um, the trade bill committee down in Westminster and what I've heard here as well, it sounds to me that um, that that's not a correct assumption and that there certainly will be at least some of those deals that will get opened up for renegotiation and that and therefore we think it's a very important that parliament in Westminster but additionally up here has a say because of the um, you know the differences in the different parts of the UK and the potential impacts which I could say a little bit more about but I, I don't know if someone was going to ask a question about that. Mm. Uh, Gujan was going to ask you about that, so we move on yeah, to that. that. Actually ties in perfectly because, um, Liz, I was wanting to come to you next, actually, just to tease out some more um, from the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition evidence. Um, because actually I attended uh, an event in Parliament, I think it was either last month or uh, a wee while ago anyway, uh, where we discussed some of the issues um, with the Trade Bill in particular. So it was really just to get your thoughts on, I mean, some of the, the free trade agreements that 
we are part of at the moment, where you think the problems in those have been. And, you know, you talk in the evidence about the fact that there is a clear democratic deficit um, and how we best go about trying to resolve that through uh, the current trade bill at the moment. Um, so the, uh, I, I'm not able to give you detail on, sp on specific trade deals that the, we're party to as, the, as part of the EU at the moment, um, because what we've been looking at is, the, is this kind of, if you like, a sort of new generation of bigger um, trade deals between the TTIP being the classic example and then CETA and um, and the, I guess but through those, the encroachment into public policy space that we've seen, the moving away from, from the tariff and quotas into, away from the customs barrier, if you like, um, and, the, um, and the mechanisms in, and the way that the mechanisms in those trade deals are potentially going to be used, um, like the investor state dispute settlement mechanism or even that, the investor court system to sue governments. Um, for loss of for loss of profit through public policy decision making and the chilling effect, for example, that has. So we have a whole range of worries around that, um, and that that's what's sort of influencing our our view that it's absolutely vital that parliamentarians have a say on get it in the trade in this current trade bill, so that if it's needed, if parliamentary scrutiny is needed to, on the transfer of those. Um, of those trade deals that we have, we're, that the UK um, continues, um, that is currently part of as being part of the EU, but also to set a, a precedent for um, future trade deals. And of course, because of what we saw with TTIP, we are particularly concerned about a possible trade deal in the future with the US. So uh, there was another bit to your question that I'm sorry I didn't note it down, but. I, uh, no, that's fine. Um, so. Ideally, I mean, what do you think we need to see come out of future agreements? And I'd like to tease out a bit more about what you mentioned there about the wider impact on other public policy areas as a result of some of these agreements, which may not have been considered so much at the moment as part of the current trade bill. Um, so I, do, you, do you mean where we've seen public policy have to change as a result of... Yeah, of so the wider impact of some of these agreements. Yeah, and where you've seen that change in, in, in other areas. So, well, so there, are, there are examples, um, there are many examples around the world where um, governments have had to um, have stopped, had to uh, put on ice, maybe, if you like, um, uh, their public policy measures. So it, just in the news again yesterday was the Philip Morris example, the example of Philip Morris having sued the Australian government. Um, which they didn't win, but that court case took, um, I don't know, six, seven years maybe um, or so, and the estimates are that it cost the Australian government just the legal costs um, $50 million, um, although that's not a, not a certain figure. But that the, what happened there was that they also, that ha did have a chilling effect on plain packaging of cigarettes uh, that other countries around the world were thinking about those policies. New Zealand in particular is the example that's given and they were holding on waiting. So there's, um, you know, there's direct, there's huge costs potentially to governments through that system. And there's direct effects on, on public policy space. And if we wanted to look at, at an example that's transferable perhaps to um, the interaction between a national and subnational um, government, you can look at the um, Lone Pine case where, um, the L Lone Pine is suing the Canadian government for a decision to put a moratorium on fracking that the Quebec government took. Um, and we, through a PQ, so th relating that back here, which again, I, I, all, all, I'm say all these things I'm saying is to sort of back up the evidence that we think that parliamentary scrutiny is really important and, Scot and for Scotland to have the Scottish Parliament to have some say over, over future trade deals um, in a PQ that was asked actually well over a year ago now um, about what would happen in the case of, of, um, the, of the UK government being sued under a trade deal for po policy differences between the Scottish, between Scotland, say, or the devolved administrations and the UK. Um, and the answer to that was that the claim would be brought against the UK for a difference in policy um, under ISDS. Um, so it said that if the UK were to lose a claim, so the UK government would be fighting it if they lost it um, under an ISDS um, 
f um, for, a, for something which relates to an act of, dev of, act of a devolved administration, the memo of understanding between the UK and the devolved administrations would apply, and that provides that the devolved administration would be responsible for the payment of the legal costs and awards made by the tribunal to the extent that they arise from the failure of the devolved administration to implement or enforce an obligation. So, um, where we said in our evidence that Scotland's inextricably linked <laughs> to these trade deals, there's potential impacts on, on policy here and the ability of the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament to um, take its own decisions in the interests of, of the, you know, public health in Scotland or the environment in Scotland. Um, and also, there are potentially, there are financial consequences. Um, if the UK government were to be sued under a trade agreement for differences for something that the Scottish Parliament had enacted. So at the moment, the trade bill has no provision at all for parliamentary scrutiny for MPs nor for the devolved administrations either. So <clears throat> there is an amendment that's been put down to try and rectify that. Um, but we think that's really important and that's why we were suggesting that the Scottish Parliament should withhold its consent on that basis until, the, un, until or unless the bill is amended to allow more parliamentary scrutiny. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matthias, you have experience in negotiating in Canada where obviously the uh, uh, regional governments were very involved. Um, I don't know if you want to pick up on any of the points that Liz Murray made there in the Canadian context. Sure, I mean, I, I think we've seen um, over the last 20 years as, as trade agreements have moved sort of beyond the border, as, as Liz was saying, they're no longer about uh, tariffs, um, but they're largely about uh, national regulation um, because the general push has been to sort of have global convergence. That's sort of the, the broader steam effect of, of trade agreements. And so in the Canadian context, as that sort of became uh, clear that trade agreements were having an impact on health, energy, environment, uh, labor, policy, et cetera, and to many areas that were, in the Canadian context, provincial um, uh, areas of jurisdiction, uh, there'd been a process of, uh, over time, increasing um, participation of the provinces in, in both development of trade policy um, and in the CETA case, it was quite exceptional in the sense that uh, provincial governments were part of the negotiating teams to a certain extent to the negotiations. They weren't there for the final deals, but they were part of the, the process along the way, largely because the provincial governments had the expertise in the particular areas. Um, so, um, but in the Canadian context, there's always been a very strong federal-provincial consultation process to ensure the provinces have real-time input as things are happening in the negotiations, and that's worked quite well in the Canadian context to have sort of a pan-Canadian approach, but also um, uh, political buy-in at all levels for any deal, and that's been viewed as important. Uh, in the, I will know in the Canadian context, that's very ad hoc, so it's not formalized through any pr proper institutional uh, mechanism, but it is a practice that's been adopted and um, depending on the trade deal or the government in power, uh, either that relationship becomes uh, stronger and, and more, uh, more inclusive and other times less so. Um, so there are maybe some lessons for the devolved governments there about the kind of mechanisms that, that can be put in place to ensure uh, information flows both ways as opposed to just you know, being told after the fact. I believe the UK is quite unusual in not having a process of, you know, with, uh, the ratification process for CETA as a member state, there's very little input at all from MPs on that. So um, we don't feel like we're asking for anything radical and that it's, you know, there are many examples of other countries, Denmark and Belgium and, um, and the US even has, and Germany. Anyway, there's many examples of countries where there's much greater interaction and, and much more say for different levels of government. Yes. Quickly clarify something that, that Liz said, not to take away from, from what your argument, I agree with you about scrutiny and about ISDS, but the dampening effect of the challenge on plain packaging may be the case in smaller countries, but in New Zealand's case, as I understand it, what New Zealand was actually waiting for was an outcome in the WTO dispute settlement um, on this, which is not ISDS, it's government to government. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Ross Greer. Thanks, Much has actually already been covered, so just one uh, small additional point. Um, public procurement is uh, an area that has increasingly become part of trade negotiations. It's also one of the remaining significant areas of disagreement between the Scottish and UK governments on our withdrawal bill and issues of devolved powers and re-reservation, etc. I was wondering, does anyone have an example of what is 
what is the objective sought when public procurement is brought into trade negotiations? And have there been any particular examples of where trade deals negotiated have resulted in a significant shift in how public procurement is operated? Um, it, it's not my specific area of expertise, but if you look at the uh, agreement on government procurement at the WTO um, and it, the, renewed, the renewed version in 2012, um, I mean, there's a really good example of sort of how you can see the specific sectors countries have opened up. And if, uh, as I was mentioning before, you can look, uh, you know, EU member by EU member, including the UK. Look, you look at the schedule, you can see which bodies have been um, listed as open to uh, government procurement bidding from members of the agreement. So, I mean, the, what's important about the, the government procurement agreement at the WTO is that governments have sort of a threshold uh, for the size of the contract for which it becomes open to members. So there's a, a threshold and then they list specific sectors in quite a lot of detail. Um, so the general thrust is to open up um, government procurement to international competition. Um, and if you look more specifically at, at the EU schedules, you'll get a better sense of um, which, you know, uh, the profile of, let's say, English bodies, Welsh bodies, Scottish bodies that are, that are currently part of the agreement. Um, it doesn't fully answer your question, but I think that's yeah, no, absolutely. That, that was useful. Um, and Liz might know. Am I right in saying that that was one of the specific concerns around TTIP was the opening up opening up internationally tendering processes for health services in the UK? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and other and other public services, you know, mm. university, the tertiary education, mm. and potentially water. And, yeah. It's possible to negotiate a carve out for for those. Yeah. Which is normally what the EU does. I mean, it's again not my area of expertise. I don't deal, but the EU will normally exclude what it defines as public services from its current free trade agreements, which was another division with the United States during the negotiations. So I suppose if you have a positive or a negative listing, the, the, the mm. negative listing seems to us to be a um, less secure, if yeah, you like, yeah, yeah. way of doing it, that, yeah. because, particularly if things change in the future because mm -hmm. you're locked into that. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's important distinctions mm -hmm. there, I think, aren't there, and things that would concern us with that. I suppose the question then is the EU, as, as a large and powerful trading bloc, is able to negotiate those kind of opt-outs. Would the UK be able to, if it was in you know, the negotiations with the US, for example, would we have the clout to be able to, to make the level of exclusions that perhaps we would want to see? It would have a price. Mm. That, that's, it would be a trade-off. Yeah. yeah. And also, the, the, obviously, there's differences between, for example, the NHS up here and in, down in England, but to be the UK government doing that negotiating for those trade deals, not mm. and at the moment with no Scottish input. But, I mean, we're suggesting there should be a Scottish representative on negotiating, a Scottish government representative on negotiating teams. So. But at the moment, that's not, that's not being suggested. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just go back to uh, an area um, that perhaps we, we, sh we should have covered earlier, um, it's on the whole issue around rules of origin. And obviously, uh, <laughs> can you see a slight look of exasperation there? Um, <laughs> obviously, um, uh, the UK would have to apply rules of origin if it wants preferential access to EU markets. And I wondered whether you were able to say anything about, uh, about the challenges uh, of gearing up uh, for rules of origin after the transition period. Uh, is it achievable? I'll say something in a minute. You go ahead. Legally speaking, Rules of origin are a whole area of trade law. I never teach it in my courses because it's highly technical and complex to understand. Uh, so that requires uh, uh, quite a bit of effort there, yeah, from a legal perspective, um, uh, to renegotiate. The problem is all this assuming the UK leaves the custom union, yeah, because in the custom union there is no rules of origin. Products come from the EU. It doesn't matter how they've been assembled, whether there is inputs from Spain, Italy, and so on, yeah, in, in, in a product that is exported from the UK. They come from the EU. That's the origin, the EU market, yeah? If the UK leaves the custom union, that will have to change, yeah? There will have to be products that come originate in the UK, yeah? 
and uh, the question that comes there is, uh, um, at the moment, yeah, in terms of rule of origin, we have full cumulation at regional level, yeah, within the EU market, yeah. Uh, so as I said, it doesn't matter where the inputs come from, yeah. This is an EU good, yeah. Will you be able to maintain that uh, uh, with the European Union, this full cumulation that we currently have in an FTA? Yeah, and a free trade agreement will need to have rules of origins. So will you be able to maintain that full accumulation? Yeah, that is, doesn't matter where your inputs come from. Yeah, it will be a good originating in the UK. Yeah, or will, you, will the EU require, as is required from third countries in other FTAs, that a minimum percentage comes from the UK for it to be a UK good that can export to the EU on the terms agreed in that FTA? Yeah. Uh, that is the challenge, the legal challenge, yeah, that, that negotiations. There is also a practical challenge, yeah, is that right now to export to the EU, you don't have to prove any origin. You just export, yeah, this is a new good, yeah. Um, even if, assuming you can meet the requirements of rule of origins that are negotiated in this FTA, as I said, the amount, yeah, if, if there is any criteria you need to meet or whether the EU will just allow you to fully accumulate, yeah, uh, on a regional basis. But you need to prove to the custom authorities of any of the uh, 20, 27 remaining EU member states that you actually meet these criteria. And that is also time consuming. Yeah? So it's not only time consuming to actually negotiate the rules of origin, but it is also time consuming to then prove that you meet the criteria and the rules of origins, whatever those rules of origins are in the free trade agreement. So that is obviously a challenge vis-à-vis -vis the current situation, because in the current situation, there is no rules of origin. And, and Nick, this will affect, um, uh, in terms of the exporters themselves, the, 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 burden, the financial burden of taking this on is, is quite high for, for exporters. So there's both the process of training and teaching the firms how to, you know, fill out the form, essentially, to put it nicely, um, and then the cost of doing that, um, uh, you know, it's quite expensive for businesses, so it is a, it, it will have knock-on effects on the competitiveness of, of, of exporters. Okay. I think it's worth saying also that um, there is another aspect, which is that the push will come from business. I try to look at Scottish industries to see where Scottish industries might be interested in rules of origin. I mean, it's quite clear in the UK as a whole that the car industry has already started pushing for diagonal accumulation, which I'm not going to go into. It's explained in the, in the documents. Um, shortbread, do they use butter from Ireland? If they do, then rules of origin for shortbread might be, become important for if they want, if shortbread wants to be, is going to be exported to Korea, for example. Mm -hmm. so, so the push will come from there. And, and, and so the government might find itself sandwiched between other countries who might have a view on, on, on what kind of rules of origin there should be, but also it's domestic industries that are saying, we need this. Mm. Well, thank you. Sorry. Very, very clear. Clear. Sorry to delay, it's just a carry on from that question, which is around rules of origin. What about geographical indicators, which the EU has, and Scotland does uh, take advantage of? Well, how will that change, or do you see I, I was I was going to add a quick comment in that in my closing. I mean, GIs are also a very complex area of, of, of WTO law. Uh, we do have some general rules in the WTO and the TRIPS agreement on geographical indications, which will apply uh, uh, to the UK and relations uh, 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 with uh, third countries will continue to apply um, uh, when it leaves the European Union. Uh, the question here is that the EU has been quite aggressive, to put it nicely, in its policy on, on geographical indications in free trade agreements. Yeah? It has required third countries to go beyond the current commitments in the WTO, which are slightly more flexible for foodstuff than they are for wine and spirit. But in any event, in the WTO rule basically is that you have to recognize each other geographical indications, but you have a number of exceptions. 
in its free trade negotiations, the EU has been trying to limit the capacity of countries to use those exceptions. Yeah. Canada uh, knows that well for Gorgonzola, Parmesan, and other uh, type of what they consider are generic names, but the EU does not consider they are generic names, yeah, especially for cheeses and foodstuff. Yeah, that's been really, mm -hmm. uh, uh, really their thing. Uh, so I think the UK can expect that the EU will try to do the same in a free trade agreement, yeah, that they will uh, ask for the UK to continue to protect EU geographical indicators as they are doing it now, mm -hmm. on an automatic basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what, sorry to add, what will the UK's ability be to protect our own products when it comes to future trade agreements? I think vis-a-vis -vis the EU that shouldn't be a challenge because the EU yeah. is very much into protecting in geographical of, indication. Yeah. The yeah. challenge will be third countries yeah. because this is an area where the EU has had relative difficulties convincing third countries to go beyond the TRIPS agreement yeah, mm -hmm. in the FTAs. Yeah? With Canada, for instance, Canada wasn't too happy on, on, on certain terms that they consider uh, generic with the US that was the same for feta cheese and other, and other geographical indicators that the EU was pushing for, in particular for foodstuff, as I say. Mm -hmm. It's less so for wines and spirits, so the Scots, whiskey, and so on, but for agriculture foodstuff, yeah, that's really important. So I don't think in the bilateral negotiations this will be that much of an issue, yeah, because the EU will ask for the UK to continue doing what it's been doing until now, and the UK will have its own geographical indications protected in the EU. The problem will be the extent to which the UK can persuade third countries, because that's an area where the EU has had, the EU itself has had difficulties pushing its own agenda completely. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm afraid we have to uh, end it there because our next witness is due in one minute time. But can I thank our panel of witnesses today for coming to give evidence to us and we'll have a brief suspension to change their panel of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Our third item of business today is an evidence session with the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Uh, the Parliament agreed to designate the Finance and Constitution Committee as the lead committee and the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee as a secondary commission in consideration of this bill. I would like to welcome the Minister and his officials, uh, Michael Russell, uh, Luke Mc Bratney, Policy Officer, Constitution and UK Policy, and Ian Davidson, Head of Constitution and UK Relations. Um, before I move to the detail uh, of, uh, of the Bill, um, Minister, uh, I know that you were um, rather tied up here and you were not able to attend uh, the plenary with the First Minister uh, yesterday, but I wondered if you were in a position to update us on what happened there and indeed in anything uh, that you can share with us in, in terms of your, your meeting at the GMCEN previously. Of course, happy to do so. Um, yes, I had intended to support the First Minister at the Downing Street meeting yesterday, but um, I was otherwise engaged in, in this uh, uh, place. The Prime Minister, the Welsh First Minister and uh, our own First Minister all expressed the same sentiment uh, at the meeting of endeavouring to secure an agreement between the three nations involved uh, on the issues that are still outstanding on the bill. Uh, but I think it's also fair to say that the First Minister uh, of Scotland and the First Minister of Wales were very clear what would be required to secure that agreement, uh, and in particular the issue of consent coming from those legislatures to the, um, any proposals from the UK government to establish frameworks. Uh, that is the issue that has bedeviled us for the entire process of discussion. Uh, a great deal of work has been done on frameworks, and you will have seen the list of 111 that I issued uh, yesterday and the list of 153. Uh, which the UK government um, produced last Thursday. I have to say, uh, and I hope this is taken in the best spirit, in a way that was not helpful to building trust to issue a new list of that nature without consultation and indeed without even giving it to the ministers, I think is a wrong thing to do. Uh, but uh, we've done a lot of work. Uh, if there is an, uh, uh, an intention by the UK government to seek the consent of the legislators on any items in that last group of 24 or 25, and if there is a procedure agreed uh, uh, for adding any items, should they, re they require to be added, and that has been an issue for the UK government, then agreement can be found. Uh, if there is no willingness to do that, then agreement can't be found. And that's where we find ourselves. And that was also the issue at the... GMCEN um, last week. GMCEN uh, that took place at the Mark Drakeford's proposal from Wales was that there was a trilateral of David Lewington, myself and himself to see if we could break the log jam. Mr Lewington chose to make that into a full meeting of the GMCEN, which I think was not helpful in the sense that I think informal discussion might have the chance of producing results sometimes when formal discussion doesn't. Uh, but that having been said, we had the meeting, we rehearsed our positions, the UK, uh, the Scottish and Welsh governments brought to table some new ideas, including the idea of a written agreement which would um, uh, make it clear that uh, consent would not unreasonably be withheld. Uh, that was added to, I have to say, by a UK minister who thought that the proposal shouldn't be unreasonably made, which seems quite a nice and uh, neat balance. Um, but we've not had a formal response to that as yet, and those discussions will continue. I understand that David Lidington renewed his commitment at the JMC EN, at the JMCP, to continue to have discussions and said that he'd be willing to come to Edinburgh or Cardiff were that uh, necessary. And I hope we will have those discussions. Thank you very much. Now, I know there are a number of members that want to ask the Minister about this specific area before mo moving on to the detail of the bill. Um, Jackson, did you want to come in there? Me. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, in essence, I think it is this issue which is the one that determines whether or not the Scottish Government wishes to proceed with the continuity bill uh, ultimately here in Scotland. Agreement around the issue of consent is what would facilitate an agreement, which I assume is the condition, if, a, if agreed, which would unlock the necessity for the bill to proceed. I think it was the First Minister who was the first politician, if I can put it, uh, so, uh, put it directly, who in uh, an answer at First Minister's questions actually identified this as being the, the, the nub of the argument. I think it, 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 
discussions were taking place. There were rumours here, there and everywhere as to what it might be that the final uh, hint was. But it was, I think, the First Minister who kind of crystallised it in this word of consent. I, I realise discussions are ongoing, and so I don't, I don't want to in any sense prejudice them at all. But insofar as all parties in this Parliament have understood the concern the Scottish Government has about consultation as opposed to consent, does the Scottish Government understand, even if it does not support, the concern that the UK Government has had about the word consent as opposed to consult? And potentially, um, because I've never been quite clear if the Scottish Government does. I mean, I, mean I, I understand the issue that underpins it, but do they understand the, the, the reservation that exists? And I may be optimistic that that is the case, just in what's been said about consent unreasonably withheld or uh, requests unreasonably made, because it does seem to finesse around the same point. Because I've heard it said that, obviously, and the rhetoric has been given the history of everything that's gone on, it's difficult for the Scottish Government to trust the Westminster Government. Um, but at the same time, it's rather been saying, but we would like the Westminster Government to trust us in that we would not unreasonably withhold withhold consent. So I just, I'm trying to understand, and I think Alec Neil in the chamber then said, look, is there not a process around which a discussion can be had which finesses those two positions into one that is resolvable. And that is what I'm trying to understand, is something happening to try and facilitate that. And I'm sorry if that was quite long, but I, I, hope, I'm, no, I, I hope I'm trying to get to the heart of this. Well, no, I mean, you do uh, get to the heart of it. And uh, I, let me start by saying that I would be happy, and indeed many fine minds in the civil service on both sides of the border have been devoted to this issue of finessing uh, the, the issue. Uh, by finesse, we do not mean fudge. No. I... And uh, there cannot be a fudge of this issue. Um, we do understand, and I have understood for a very considerable period of time, uh, the concerns that the UK government has. They were concerns that surprised us, and they are concerns that I think, if I can roll this all the way back to the first discussion I had with David Davis about the detail of this bill in start of July last year, uh, a lack of knowledge, and I don't say that critically, I just say a lack of knowledge of the devolution of settlement, and particularly the fact that they do have a power to stop things happening or to reverse decisions in this place which exists within the Scotland Act. We, they are, in the end, sovereign. Uh, you know, I don't say that with any happiness, that's not what I want to happen, but that's the reality. So if the issue is, as I believe it is, that they are afraid that we will behave in an irrational manner, as far as they can see it, or in a manner contrary to what they believe to be the United Kingdom's interests, if I put it more positively, then they want the ability for, to stop us doing so. They have that power. The Scotland Act gives them that power. So why would they want another power so to do? And I think that they, it took a long time for that issue to be understood in London, that that existed. And, and you, know, you know, Mr Carlyle, and I pay tribute to him and others, have worked very hard to get an understanding going. And I'm sure that they have, I'm not asking to confirm this, I'm sure he has found too, a, a lack of detailed knowledge of devolution in some places uh, within the UK government and its officials. So once we got through that, then the issue did become uh, if you know, how we gave them the reassurance. But equally, we had to be clear in our mind uh, what would work for us and what wouldn't work for us. And we've been pretty methodical about this in terms of making sure that we applied tests to where we were. Uh, we tend to work like that. Uh, you know, we, we did that at the start of this process when we were discussing, I think, with Damien Green, uh, what the principles would be that would underpin the process of setting up frameworks. Uh, and actually, we were very keen to have a rational, criteria-driven approach, which Damien Green agreed, and which we got the principles established because Damien understood that. So what we've applied here are, are four tests to what is taking place and what may come out of it. Uh, and I'm happy to put them on the record because I don't think it does any harm to do so. The first test was that the scope of any power and the circumstances in which it would be used must be agreed as must the exercise of the power. So that's very clear uh, and that, that respects the devolved settlement. Secondly, any constraint must apply equally to all of the administrations. Thirdly, any power of constraint and orders made under uh, the, uh, the bill should, as is generally the case with powers under the Withdrawal Bill, expire automatically after a defined 
period, the sunsetting, in other words. And finally, the devolved legislators should exercise at least the same degree of scrutiny over orders and the frameworks that flow from them as the UK Parliament. Now, those are clear tests. Now, all of those, the unlocking of those comes in the first test. Because if you accept the first test, essentially the others flow from it. Um, and you know, we could have a form of words that covers the other tests. But you can't have a form of words that, that actually does anything with the first test. That, that's a basic, that is a binary. It either is or isn't. The existence of the backstop that they wish is the, is the obstacle to getting that first test passed. And as we contend there is a backstop, because it exists in the Scotland Act, then we don't think you need that unnecessary additional backstop, which is derailing the process. That's a debate. Now, yes, this will depend on trust. So how do you reassure people of what you're trying to do and that, you're, that there isn't a Trojan horse in this? Now, of course, the answer in the devolution, uh, in the independence referendum, was to have a written agreement, which was there, which was about a range of things, but it, was, it allowed things to go forward. So if we were to have the first test accepted and passed, then we should enshrine that in some sort of written agreement uh, which you know, is visible, public, there, and which says nobody is going to do propose things that are unreasonable and nobody is going to withhold consent unreasonably. Now, I think that's still uh, a way forward. But, you know, they have to accept, first of all, that they can meet these tests and will meet these tests. That's the issue. That is the issue which the House of Lords will have to confront too. And, you know, I mean, quite clearly the House of Lords will uh, first consider these items next Monday, I think, uh, in terms of its consideration, there will be no resolution because I don't think there's any expectation of a vote. There hasn't yet been a vote uh, at the, the committee stage of, in the House of Lords on this, and that's not normally what the Lords do. But when this returns at report stage, which will be after Easter, then there will be presumably a vote on the amendment which has been tabled by the UK government, which does not meet those tests, that's important to say, um, and any other amendments that are there. Just briefly, I, I mean, I, I, I'm very grateful for all of that. Of course, the distinction in relation to the uh, Scottish independence type discussions that were taken would have been between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Within the frameworks, we're talking about three devolved administrations and Westminster. So, it, 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 in a sense, the Scottish government has got just as much of a vested interest in the not unreasonably held or not unreasonably asked question because any one of the devolved administrations in a matter affecting the framework of the UK, which could be just as important to any trading op, uh, organisation or e economic respective factor in Scotland, would not want to find it was being prejudiced by a, a dispute over um, uh, agreement within the framework, which the origin of which was absolutely nothing to do with the issue in hand whatsoever, but was motivated by something completely differently. And it, 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 it's that multiplicity, is it not, of the four parties to the framework that just means there has to be a, a mechanism by which one can ensure that the process can proceed across the territories of all four, i.e. the United Kingdom, um, and, and not just the bilateral kind of arrangement that maybe you were referring to before. No, I, I wasn't. Uh, I, I want to be clear about that. Any agreement would be an agreement that would be an, an agreement between three parties, certainly. I, I, an agreement with Northern Ireland is very difficult to envisage because <coughs> there is no uh, administration and no parliament there. Um, and I don't think there's an agreement the civil service could enter into. In a sense, uh, you know, the United Kingdom government might be agreeing with itself in Northern Ireland, given where things are just now. For the moment. Uh, for the moment. But at the present moment, though, that would be a multilateral space. Uh, but I do want to just challenge you a little on the issue of, <coughs> of trade. This is clearly about trade it, you know, in the mind of the United Kingdom government. I think there are wider issues, but that this is about trade. But this is a normal part of a trading relationship with a range of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're going to do a trade treaty with Canada, for example, and the Prime Minister keeps holding up the Canadian treaty as an example, you do it on the basis that uh, it's a federation, admittedly, but you do it on the basis that the powers of the, the, the provinces, where they relate to items within that treaty, require the agreement of the provinces. That is a part of the constitutional settlement. Uh, and therefore, you, you take it as read. That's how you negotiate. Um, uh, that applies, for example, in Belgium, you know, even in its relationship with the EU. There are rights that are given 
and which are exercised responsibly. You can, of course, have exceptions. You know, the, the, the Canadian Treaty, the, the, the position of one of the Belgian parliaments, and this is given an example. But it's a point I made uh, to David Liddington last week, and I'm making it again here. You need to have the principle established, and then you can legislate for the except, exceptions. So in this circumstance, if you accept the principle that there has to be consent, then you legislate for the circumstances when they arise of difficulties that exist. What has happened to the United Kingdom government with the greatest respect is they've started with the difficulties and the exemptions, and they're trying then to derive a general principle from those. That is the wrong way to argue this. And if we can agree the, the general principle, and I've made it clear what the tests are for that general principle, then the exemptions can be dealt with and the difficulties can be dealt with. And you can allow for those difficulties in those circumstances. Okay, thank you, convener. Uh, Richard Lockwood, you've indicated you want to come in. Is it on the subject of negotiations? Yes, it's on the subject of negotiations of consent. Yes. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I struggle with Jackson Carlaw's view that there's an easy bridging between the principles of consent and consultation because they're, uh, they are two different fundamental principles. Can you give me an assurance that uh, you will continue to pursue that we will only accept the principle of consent and that as part of the negotiations there will not be goodwill agreements or frameworks agreed to out with the legislation that weaken that principle? Uh, I think the First Minister has made it absolutely clear that she could not envisage coming to the Scottish Parliament and recommending acceptance by the Scottish Parliament of an agreement with the UK Government that was, did not deal absolutely with this test, as I've put it. Uh, and I repeat it, the scope of any power and the circumstances in which it would be used must be agreed as must the exercise of the power. That is the basic thing. And I, I mean, Carwin Jones has said exactly the same. He couldn't see himself going to the Welsh Assembly in those circumstances. So yes, I mean, that, that is the basic issue uh, 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 that is the, at the heart of this. If that issue is resolved, then progress can be made. And of course, uh, Mr. Carlaw raised the question of, of the bill. Now, I think the bill is a bill that's perfectly operable. It's been improved by extensive scrutiny and will continue, no doubt, to be improved. But the, uh, Section 37 of the Act was actually, uh, there was an agreed amendment to it last night. I think it was the, the very last thing that we actually did last night on a, on a motion, if I remember correctly, from Liam Kerr, an amendment from Liam Kerr. And it says, 37.1, the Scottish ministers may by regulations repeal this Act, and we've taken out or any provision of this Act. So it's, it is, again, binary. The back Act exists or does not exist. And two, regulations under subsection 1 are subject to the affirmative procedure. There it is. You know, this can be repealed. We can bring regulation for the Chamber to approve on this Act, and we, we have said we will do so, you know, providing the tests are met, consent is met. So, yes, I give you the, the, the assurance you were seeking. Thank you. The, the kind of presentation of, of this issue and the public discourse around it has tended to concentrate on uh, the 25 areas uh, that the... Um, UK government says that uh, discussion is needed for legislative frameworks. But in your letter to M MSPs, uh, you emphasise that the EU withdrawal bill is currently drafted, allows the UK government to constrain the powers of the Scottish Parliament in any devolved area, so it could take any devolved power and, uh, and, and put them into that basket, if you like. Um, do you think that the, there's a, a, an understanding that that's what the EU withdrawal bill is doing, and how hopeful are you that we'll get agreement on that particular aspect of the withdrawal bill? Yeah. It is any area of intersection. You know, I mean, we're not yet at the stage where absolutely any devolved power can be removed. But of course, it, it's right that the, you know, the Scottish government is always mindful of the threat to devolution. That's, that's what we're there for. I mean, you know, we may have other political objectives. I have another political objective with respect, so do you, convener. But the reality is that the role and responsibility of the Scottish Government is to make sure that devolved settlement is not undermined. We don't lose powers. I mean, we're talking about gaining more powers. So you know, in those circumstances, at present, what we're talking about is areas of EU intersection. But anything on this list could move from the first category of saying we're not really concerned about that to the final new category, which is we believe this is uh, uh, reserved. Now, that may sound silly, but actually, you know, lawyers can often, not that I'm bad-mouthing lawyers, but lawyers can often argue any convincing case and, you know, might well do so. So the problem we have here is that this list isn't agreed. 
the list that we thought we were getting close to agreeing has changed, um, and without notification to us, uh, which is a difficult thing to, to happen. And there are some very important things in this list which are, would be subject to freezing or re-reservation or call it what you like. I mean, you know, agricultural support, which appeared in the December list, people might have just shrugged. But, you know, it is, and I quote from this, um, policies and regulations under the EU common agricultural policy covering pillar one, income and market support, pillar two, uh, this, those, and cross-cutting issues including cross-compliance, finance and controls. Now, you know, I don't have to tell you, and I certainly don't have to tell Richard Lockhead, what that means. That is absolutely central. That is a whole centerpiece of, of, of agriculture in Scotland. And that is in here. Moreover, it gives the lie, I have to say, to the argument that, the, that these are items that are only held in Brussels. Because the way in which the support is given and defined can be altered and is altered in Scotland. The example I've used before is less favoured area payments, but there are other examples. So these are active things, but it's you know, agriculture, um, animal welfare, chemical regulation. That's really, really important. If you have, as I have in my um, constituency, an ongoing argument about the use of neonicotinoids you know, and the possible effect on private water supplies, you know, I have constituents who will be immensely worried that that is moving from the Scottish uh, Parliament and government somewhere else. But then we look at other ones. Food and, uh, food and Feed Safety and Hygiene Law, how important that is in terms of our uh, in food and, and drink industries, and it's in here. Environmental quality, you know, you look at all this stuff and you think this is really concerning. Um, and mutual recognition of professional qualifications, which sounds dull, actually is exceptionally important in terms of the health service, as well as some other uh, places. Public procurement. Well, there was a whole debate about that in the chamber yesterday. Public procurement is worth a vast amount of money. So these are really serious issues which we require to defend in the interests of Scotland. But we could have an agreement on them, provided that issue of consent is recognised. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move on to Claire Baker. Mr. Russell, um, you know clearly those uh, those common frameworks are really important. And you said that one of your tests, uh, the, the fourth test that you had, was to um, have some degree over the scrutiny over the common framework, frameworks, as does the UK government. What? Um, how are you actually doing that? How are you scrutinising these common frameworks? Um, how are you representing? Um, the views of um, Scottish businesses over things like water quality and food labelling? Because it appears just now that, you know, um, the, the general public are, are believing this to be a power grab. But however, do they actually understand what are the implications of um, some of these common frameworks? And, and how are you translating that within to your scrutiny? Well, let's separate out the test from that more general question. What I said in the test, and I repeat it, uh, on point four, the devolved legislators, legislatures, so that's all of us as the Parliament, should exercise at least the same degree of scrutiny over orders and the frameworks that flow from them as the UK Parliament. That's an issue of parliamentary democracy. What is, this is saying, and I'm sure uh, after uh, the, this, the stage two process, you know, uh, the bona fides in this, I'm still talking about we believe that the Parliament should have a role. If the UK Parliament has a role, Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament should have a role. That's what I'm saying. On the issue of frameworks, well, I've indicated you know, what I think the issues are. Uh, and I don't think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, food safety and food labelling, that removing the responsibility for that from the Scottish Parliament in a way that is not time-limited and a way in which we have no control will be of benefit to the food and drink industries of Scotland. They also do not believe that is the case. You know, th and that is the... In devolution, the principle of subsidiarity applies. What is the right place for these decisions to be made? Now, this is you know, an argument that goes a long, long way back. There was, a, there was an exhibition outside the chamber, I think, two weeks ago of John P. McIntosh. And, of course, the library is named after John P. I'm old enough to have served on John P. McIntosh's rectorial committee at Edinburgh University. But, you know, John P. McIntosh, as a political um, uh, scientist as well as an active politician, wrote extensively on the issue of subsidiarity and why it was important. And subsidiarity drove the process uh, of establishing this parliament. So that is a principle that underlines these, and people do understand it. You know, if you go and talk, I, you know, if I go and talk to farmers in my constituency, as I've said, if I go and talk to people in my constituency who are concerned about neonicotinoids, and you say, you know, you can come to me, and we can talk about those issues, and I can make representations on those issues as you can, 
as a, a, a constituency MSP, as, as you now are, you can make those representations. But take this, take this route that the UK government is taking, and you can't. Those are frozen, those have gone away. And we don't know when we're getting them back, and we don't know what state they will be in when they get back. So the issue of agreement that that's going to happen, participation by the legislators, is very important, uh, as is the work together to make sure that these frameworks benefit all of us. And that's what's been going on, a way in which we, they will work together. And the principles I talked about with Damien, you know, I said that Damien Green had agreed, were crucial to this. Uh, we got um, the principles set up. Common frameworks will be established when they're necessary in order to, and there's a range of things. Frameworks will respect the devolution settlements and the democratic accountability of the devolved legislators, your constituents, my constituents, to whom we are reporting on this issue. Frameworks will ensure recognition of the economic and social linkages between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and Northern Ireland but the only part of the UK which shares a land frontier with the EU. They will also adhere to the Belfast Agreement. That's in the principles. So we're also saying we recognise the wider context of this, and we're all committed to getting it right. Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm interested in the scenarios we might be facing if the legislation is passed, which we're set to do next week. Um, when we took evidence last week, we discussed with Professor Nicola McEwen the three options that were set out in the policy memorandum. And I was particularly interested in a kind of middle way option. What happens if both the Continuity Bill and the EU Withdrawal Bill are passed? And there's a suggestion that there could be a qualified withholding of consent from the Scottish Parliament, that the two bills would then in some way merge. So it was just, if you could provide more detail on how that would work. Well, yeah, I mean, work. this bill is being very carefully drafted, and in my view, well drafted, and then improved further by scrutiny and, uh, 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 and amendment. Um, so we have a bill that is capable of operating. And I made a commitment in the, I think the last statement I made last night, uh, at some hour or whatever, when, when we were doing it, that I'm not going to seek to overturn amendments to the bill made at stage two, uh, merely because I think you know, I want to get my own way, I'll only bring back any changes to those if I believe the bill isn't operable. So I want to have a bill that is operable and functional. Uh, now then there's a number of things that can happen. Uh, you know, it could be that section 37 is, 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 goes forward and we bring regulation to repeal the act because we have achieved the agreement with the UK government. That means that we repeal this act and we pass a legislative consent motion. Uh, and that has to be passed by the last amending stage of the bill, which is the report stage at, uh, in the House of Lords, which will be after Easter at some stage. Uh, there's a slight vagueness about that, because there, it is possible at the third reading stage to amend in the House of Lords, as I understand. But we are expectation it will be the report stage of the bill. So that's one. Legislative consent motion is passed. Bill's not there. We've all done a great job. We've got a bill that works well, but we've accepted those circumstances. I think if that doesn't happen, uh, and there is no agreement on it, then we are into a situation where we have to operate this bill. Now, this bill is operable. And with goodwill, this bill could work with the United Kingdom government. This bill has been drafted so to do. That's why we've followed very, very closely the United Kingdom bill. That's why the Welsh have taken the same approach. So we find ourselves in a situation where we operate this bill, the United Kingdom bill operates, uh, and we can uh, shorn, of course, of the parts to which we have not given consent. That is important. Uh, so the two bills operate together, and they operate in a way that we, we try to work together. So, for example, in the programme of secondary legislation, uh, we try and cooperate on that. And that, that recognises the reality of the situation that we're in. Um, I don't think that's difficult to do, but that's not our first choice. And our first choice remains to try and get an agreement with the UK. Um, just so I understand how that process would, would work. So if the two bills were passed, if we got to that stage, I agree that I would, we would much rather see agreement between the two governments, but if we're not in that situation and two bills are passed, for them both to be operable would need the agreement of the UK government, to, would it? Or, well, well, and it, does one bill have precedence over that? Uh, <coughs> assumption that it's not the best use of language, but I think the UK bill that trumps would, the Scottish well, Parliament. That, that bill would depend what the UK chooses to do. That's essentially the, the, the oh. final option. You know, and, and then there's, there's a number of options within that. I'm, I'm honestly not trying to complicate this anymore. I'd quite like to simplify it if I could. But you know, you're then into a range of options. You've got the, you know, the absolute extreme end of the option that they, <coughs> this is challenged by uh, the UK government, uh, either by the Advocate General, the Attorney General, or the Advocate General that would challenge it. It goes to the Supreme Court. <coughs> there's then a, you know, another part of the branch diagram. The Supreme Court says it's entirely legitimate constitutional. 
it says it isn't constitutional. I, I'm absolutely confident it will say it's within the uh, rights of this Parliament. So to do, Mr Kylo, by grinning, seems to mean that he doesn't agree with me. That will not be a surprise to anybody who knows us or who knows this Parliament. So we then have that situation. If the bill is uh, within the competence of the Parliament, uh, then it would be up to the United Kingdom government to say, you know, well, even that's the case, we're no, we don't want it. So they can use their power under the Scotland Act, and that's what takes place. Or they can choose to sit down and say, OK, we accept that. We accept that there won't be a legislative consent motion, which applies, of course, to only to parts of the bill. We'll take those parts of the bill out, and we'll find a way to work together. Uh, and that's perfectly possible to do. This bill is designed so to do. It can be done in that way. Be responsible of us to bring anything to this chamber that couldn't work in that way. Uh, and that's where we are. Uh, but you know, those are all decisions, in the end, that the United Kingdom government has to make. It has to decide whether or not it wants an agreement on the basis that I've, I've outlined. If it doesn't, in the end, can't move in that direction, then it would have to decide whether it challenges the bill uh, or whether it can live with it and it can accept they won't get a legislative consent motion. Then, of course, it would be the view of the House of Lords. What would the House of Lords' view be of there being no legislative <coughs> consent motion but a desire of the United Kingdom government to overrule a bill legitimately passed in this chamber? I don't want that to happen. The best solution to this is the solution you and I agree on, which is to get an agreement with the UK government. And if that happens, section th pres presuming this bill is passed next week, section 37 of the Act comes into... And I make that commitment. I've made that commitment every day, several times a day for the last few weeks, and I make it again here. That's what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Ross Creer. I'm OK at the moment, Kavina. OK. Mary Cushion. Um, it was really just to... Um, in relation to the European Commission draft negotiating guidelines for the future relationship that were published, um, and where it states that in terms of a free trade agreement, such an agreement cannot offer the same benefits as membership and cannot amount to participation in the single market or parts thereof. So it was really just to get your view on those guidelines that were published. Well, the guidelines are clear, uh, you know, and they, they, they are not a, a surprise. Uh, you know, I had discussions six months ago uh, you know, in Brussels where people were saying to me, if the UK government's red lines are these, that is what the outcome will be, because there's no way round that. If that, that's absolutely where the UK government stands, this is what happens. We published in uh, the, the SPY 2 paper, um, which I usually have a copy to wave around, but I, for some reason, have left it. Other things have been happening this week. Um, we published at the start of that a diagram uh, a chart from the EU Commission that showed why that was the case. It showed the type of arrangements that they've come to with other people, EEA membership, the special arrangements with the, the Ukraine, the special arrangements with Turkey, the Canadian Treaty, and it indicated what, why the red lines were driving in that direction. So uh, the Commission is making it absolutely clear that the existence of the red lines are the issues that pre predicate what outcome they would be. If those red lines change, then the possible outcome changes. Uh, but you can't, you know, you cannot, whether it is in, you know, membership of the EU or membership of a golf club, you cannot say, look, I'm intending to have all the benefits of membership, I'm intending to turn up here every morning, play 18 holes, go to the bar, have lunch, play another 18 holes, you know, go to the bar in the evening, come to all the social events, but I'm not paying any fee, uh, and I'm absolutely not going to abide by the rules, so it doesn't matter what the draw is in terms of how you, know, how you use it, whether the course is closed or open, I'm going to do it. You can't do that. It just isn't possible. And simply, you can't be a member of this club uh, you know, and actually not observe the rules. Now, you know, then we get the ludicrous spectacle of those people who believe that is possible, then blaming the EU for having its own rules and saying it is making a victim of those people who are actually simply saying, look, you, know, you don't want to be a member of the club. We regret that. We deeply regret that. But if that's your decision, uh, then there are consequences that flow. And that's not, that's not victimising. That's not bullying. That's just saying what the legal situation is. I uh, just have another particular question, and obviously there was a lot of play, press coverage uh, last week about the reciprocal access to fishing waters and a lot of publicity around that. And really uh, looking for the Scottish Government's view uh, on that provision within the guidelines and how do you think that, that can progress from here? Well, <coughs> I noticed that the weekend there was an intervention on this from Ruth Davidson and Michael Gove, who were uh, calling for... Uh, the UK to leave the CFP on 
the 29th of March 2019. And from that moment, or at least when the coastal state uh, status kicks in, then everything would be uh, as uh, they had promised to uh, fishermen in Scotland uh, during the referendum and thereafter. Promises, of course, that were also repeated by members of the Scottish Parliament uh, in the northeast of Scotland and indeed in the Chamber. The difficulty and problem with that is twofold. One is at the same time the UK government is endeavouring to negotiate a continuation for a period of time um, which requires observing the acquis. Not cherry picking from the acquis, but observing the acquis. And there has never been any indication at any time that, that, would, uh, that fishing would be exempted from that. And indeed, I asked David Davis that question directly at the JMC EN in October. And in, I have continued to ask that question, and I've always had the same reply, which is fishing will be included. So what was promised and what continues to be promised cannot be achieved. So I understand why perhaps Michael Gove and Ruth Davidson are making a bit of a noise, because they're about to be found out. But the second issue here is the fact that the United Kingdom government has form, all the United Kingdom governments have form, in taking uh, Scottish assets such as you know, fishing and trading it away for advantage to themselves. And again, I think that Mr Gove and Ms Davidson recognise that that's an action that's presently underway. And they may be trying to stop it, I don't know, but their, the track record of this in the UK government is quite clear and that's where those things are going. So those are problems. And the third problem with that is where Michel Barnier and others have been on this very clearly. When he was in Jutland two weeks ago talking to Danish fishermen, he made it clear something that's always been the case, which is that uh, access to waters and trade are inexplicably, inextricably linked. And indeed, the UK government knows that. Because it knows, for example, that Iceland and Norway, uh, as members of the EA, uh, accept tariffs to which increase the cost of their fish exports. And they do that because they wish to, to have exclusive access to and to negotiate their own waters. So the idea, which was very much put around during the referendum and thereafter, particularly in the Northeast, that there is some magic squaring of this circle and that tariffs and access are not linked, was, well, I'll be kind, it was magical thinking. Some might call it simply being deceitful about this matter. And that is the reality where we are. Now, we don't want Scottish waters to be traded away. We've always opposed that. We have also always argued for local management. We do not think the CFP has been successful. And, and of course it hasn't. And there needs to be a replacement for it. But, you know, we are also opposed to people saying things that aren't true. Uh, because eventually you'll get found out. I just have one final question. Uh, obviously, just before you came in, we had a panel looking at possibilities for uh, future trading arrangements. Um, and obviously, there are certain sectors and industries in Scotland uh, where our exports, uh, sectors in particular, that are of greater importance to us than they would be uh, of the UK as a whole. We took evidence from tra the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition in terms of the democratic deficit that exists in the moment in terms of the input that we have into the Trade Bill and uh, ongoing discussions around that. Are there, I'm just wondering what discussions are underway between the Scottish Government and the UK Government at the moment as to how we ensure that the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government have a meaningful say in the, the, especially in negotiations and discussions relating to trade moving forward? There are, there are two areas uh, which are of importance to this. One is to resolve the present difficulty over the withdrawal bill, uh, because quite clearly if that is removed, then discussions and trust becomes easier to, to, uh, to get. Um, but the, 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 the second issue in here is that there is a commitment from the UK government to bring to the JMCEN a paper on the involvement of the devolved administrations in the negotiating process. Now, I haven't, we haven't seen that paper. We don't know what will be in it, but it's a point that Mark Drakeford and I have been raising for well over a year because it is germane to exactly the issue you're raising, how this negotiation stance is developed on matters that pertain to devolved competences. We also try to make it understood that the, that the issue of different circumstances apply. I'll give you an example out with the trade area, and that is the, on migration. Um, 
Scotland is much more dependent upon EU migration than the rest of the UK. That's clear in the evidence that we developed for the Migrat Migration Advisory Committee, which has been published and which has been debated in the Chamber. That needs to be understood when migration policy is being developed. It's really been hard to get that understood. I, I had a conversation with a relevant UK minister. It seemed to me that in his mind, uh, he was equating the situation in Scotland with the situation of the construction industry, which has a shortfall of workers, uh, and, and they are saying we have a problem with migration. I was pointing out to him it is perhaps something that uh, needs to be understood in a different sense if you represent, as I do, a rural, extreme rural constituency that is losing population and cannot renew its population. We are, to be blunt, not breeding fast enough to renew our population. You have to have migration. Otherwise, you will continue to have depopulation, which will continue to mean that services will diminish. That's a reality. And the only migration, actually, that works in this regard and has worked over the last period has been European migration, because it's easy. People can come and go, uh, and they do, and some people stay a long time, some people stay forever, some people are there for a brief period of time. So we need a solution that essentially mirrors freedom of movement. And it's making sure that that is understood. Now, that applies in a variety of other different... It'll apply in trade, it'll apply in, the, in a whole pattern of things. And we need to get that across, and then we need to make sure, through our discussion with the UK government, through the frameworks, because the frameworks uh, mention this specifically, that they need to recognise the relative impacts that exist. And, of course, the work the UK government itself has done on economic impact shows the severe impact that would take place in different parts of the United Kingdom. I have a couple of supplementaries uh, to Mary Goodwin's questions. First, the paper you mentioned that you're preparing uh, with Mark Drakeford, can you indicate when that will be published? We're not preparing that paper. What I said was that the UK government are bringing us a paper right. on the issue of involvement in negotiations. Uh, and obviously that will be a JMC paper, so it will be within the confidential space of the JMC, but the outcomes of that, if there are any outcomes of that, will obviously be a matter of reporting to this parliament. Yeah, I'll pick you up drawing there. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, and um, the other issue was um, uh, Mary Gujan raised the fact that we had had a trade panel of trade experts here before... Uh, your own session. Uh, and one of the things that was quite interesting at the end of that was uh, uh, Dr. Grathia uh, Duran, who's a lecturer in economic law at UCL, um, was asked about geographical indicators. And her re response was that um, the EU was uh, very keen to protect its own geographical indicators. And so therefore, she didn't see a particular problem for the UK in terms of that particular negotiation with the EU. But out with the EU, when it came to uh, uh, other trade uh, agreements, she said that the rules were a lot uh, less uh, easy to enforce. And given that geographical indicators is one of the areas uh, that the UK government has said that it's keeping for itself, I wondered what you thought the problems were in that regard. Well, I think they're pretty severe. Um, you know, I, I think it could be a useful European discussion, because I think it would be better to have a pan-European system. But given the antipathy to this, except in the end when it seemed to be so necessary that even the United Kingdom government can't resist it, um, if they are determined to have their own system, the question arises, what validity does that system have and recognition does that system have in an international sphere? And is it something that can be traded away? Whiskey is a good example. You know, there's a clear definition of, of whiskey, and particularly malt whiskey. Uh, it, you know, the United States, have for a long time, wanted to change that definition because they want to get into markets and be able to call things uh, what they aren't. Um, and I think in those circumstances, that might be a, a tough set of negotiations. You know, the naivety of those who believe that the United States sentiment would overrule its hard practical edge and that there would be no uh, difficulty in having the most beneficial trading arrangement has been given a bit of a dunt in, in recent days when you look at uh, what the Trump administration's actions are. And I think it's going to be a tough business, you know. I mean, um, uh, there are people... I, I noticed today that the process has started to try and get an indica indicator for Scottish venison, you know, something the Scottish government has been involved in and deeply involved in. I think it's highly likely that people will be able to uh, uh, ignore that if we're not part of the European system. Thank you very much. It's Stuart McMillan. Um, thank you. Um, good morning, Minister. Uh, Minister, the, the Stage 3 process for the Continuity Bill uh, takes place next week, <clears throat> and the EU withdrawal will go through uh, Westminster. I think that's um, 
I think, estimated to finish around about May. Uh, can you explain uh, to the committee why uh, why there, there is that kind of uh, difference in time? Uh, is there a particular reason why uh, you wanted the continuity to be able to finish uh, earlier? Yes, I will do so briefly, but I will also have copied to you, I, I suspect you may have seen it, but I'll copy to you a letter sent to the, we sent to the Delegated Powers Committee. Um, at some stage in the last fortnight, my days sort of blend together, which gives the legal reasons why we have to have this bill passed within the timescale we have and before the United Kingdom bill gets royal assent. And there are legal re reasons within the EU withdrawal bill. But there's, a, you know, there's a, the, 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 the clear practicality of this. We've spent a lot of time trying to get an agreement with the UK government. You know, I mean, uh, many, many hours and days doing so. We've been discussing, and it's no secret because we've talked about it openly, we've been discussing withdrawal uh, uh, continuity bills with the Welsh since last summer um, uh, and having useful discussions as to whether this would be a route that we could follow. But we've always felt, you know, and continue to feel that a UK agreement would be better. But eventually, with the clock ticking and the requirements for us to have this bill through and sent for royal assent within the timescale of the United Kingdom's bill and before it gets royal assent meant that we were getting to the last moment that this could be done. And we've, we've held off as long as we could, but in the end we could hold off no longer. And we have exactly the same timetable as the Welsh uh, government and, and their bill, I think, will be at stage three on the, 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 the same day. Um, the, our process of royal assent is, of course, longer than the UK bill process. We have a, a month's lying time, I think you could call it, where it, during which uh, the bill can be challenged legally by either the Lord Advocate or the Advocate General or the Attorney General. So we have that before it can be given royal assent. So really, there's, between it, the stage three process and royal assent is about five weeks. Um, I think I'm right, roughly five weeks. Whereas the United Kingdom bill can be given royal assent within a day or so. Pretty quickly. Yeah. Pretty quickly. Um, so in those circumstances, we've got a bit of time in that process where we have to do things which they wouldn't have to do. So we would expect, it's not certain when the UK bill will pass, the House of Lords report stage should be after Easter. They're, they're actually been running behind at the moment, but they may catch up. Uh, there's then their final reading, and then they go into what is called ping pong. If they have made changes to the bill, the Commons is asked not to accept. The bill will go backwards and forwards. So I think we are we are talking um, round about the third week in May for royal assent for that bill, providing they keep to timetable. Um, whereas we hope ours will have had assent by that time. Uh, certainly, from the uh, I'm on the delegated powers on Lord Form Committee, so I'm aware You've of the. You've questioned quality. me on this before. Indeed, yeah. uh, I can, one of the aspects of the certainly that has come up in that committee um, is the issue of uh, secondary legislation, uh, as well as the other primary legislation that would then uh, emanate from uh, from the, the UK leaving uh, the EU. Now, it's estimated that some 300 pieces of uh, secondary legislation will actually be required. To come through this uh, this Parliament, uh, I mean, uh, do you think that uh, do you believe that the the Parliament uh, has got the uh, has got the necessary uh, staffing to actually deal with that in such a short space of time? And uh, well, do you think well, it will have to. Have. I mean, this would be this would be a burden we would have no matter what took place. You know, if if this process of leaving, which I oppose, which I think is wasteful, it's like black hole, it's sucking in energy and initiative and money uh, unnecessarily. But it's a process, unfortunately, we're engaged in. We didn't vote for, but we're engaged in. We will have to do these things. So, that, you know, so we are organising ourselves to do them. 300 is an estimate. It may be more. I suspect it will turn out to be more. Uh, we can work in collaboration with the UK government. We intend to work in collaboration with the UK government, no matter what happens in these circumstances. But it's going to be a heavy burden. There's also the cost of it. You know, the, the Chancellor has given uh, an allocation of money some money will come to Scotland, you know, well, that, that allocation will have to be discussed, but it may not be enough, but we'll have to get on and do the job. And, you know, people are committed to it. I mean, I have to say, this has been a difficult, interesting, unusual uh, couple of weeks, but all the parties and all the officials engaged in this and the, all the parliamentary officials have risen tremendously to that challenge. So, there, you know, there will be challenges ahead, but I'm confident they will rise to these, that challenge. How the discussion started in terms of how much of that resource will come to Scotland? Uh, 
Oh, the resource, uh, yes, uh, that is a matter you must raise with Mr. Mackay rather than me. But yes, I understand that is the case. Discussions are also well underway in terms of preparation. I don't know what either of you want to say anything about preparation. Luke, do you want to say about preparation? I think this is quite closely linked to the point that Ms. Baker made earlier, which is the three scenarios that the bill is preparing for. It's been the Scottish Government's consistent position since December 2016, when Scotland's Place in Europe was published, that the best scenario for discharging our responsibility to prepare our legislation for EU withdrawal was a single bill and a single scheme. That would provide the maximum opportunities for coordination between the government. The policy memorandum indicates the situations where we would hope to see that take place. So where, for example, changes required were uncontroversial, technical, or the same or similar across the UK's jurisdictions, they could be made at the UK-wide level with the appropriate involvement of devolved institutions. And that's what uh, Mr Russell was exploring with Ms Baker earlier, was the opportunities, even if the continuity bill does ultimately have to be operated, for attempting to maintain as much as possible of that form or that sort of cooperation. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's been helpful. My final question, uh, just it's regarding the, 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 the actual withdrawal agreement uh, legal text and the, the negotiating guidelines uh, for the future relationship um, between the, us uh, leaving. And do you think that, uh, that that will actually have uh, an impact uh, on the provisions uh, on the continuity bill? It's difficult to say. I mean, uh, you know, that there, that there, there is a linkage between everything in this process. I suppose... I suppose I would point to, if I had to, the issue of the frameworks and the operation of frameworks, particularly with the Northern Irish situation. You heard me um, uh, what, uh, say that what the final principle was. You know, the Northern Irish situation requires to be resolved. And it is difficult to see it being resolved without a degree of regulatory alignment north and south. If Northern Ireland is then, for example, taking part in a framework, say on agriculture, in which there is regulatory alignment between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and therefore there is a, the European system is operating in Northern Ireland, how do we work with that in terms of a framework? Because clearly a framework implies regulatory alignment between the parties in the framework. So do we then enter into regulatory alignment with the rest of the EU? Now, I've raised this question. It does tend to produce a bit of a... a, sort of a, a we're thinking about that reaction. But, you know, there is an issue in there. And if that applies to agriculture, it will apply across the board in a variety of other places. So there are, there are linkages. Um, we are aware of those linkages. Uh, there are linkages, the question that Marie Goujon raised in terms of the, uh, the negotiating guidelines, raise issues for us in terms of what the UK's red lines are and why we believe those are um, misplaced. They also raise issues for us of the engagement of the devolved administrations and who are representing the devolved competencies within a process in which devolved competencies will be part of the negotiations. So those are all linkages. Okay, thank you. I have a supplementary from Ross Graham. Thanks, Convener. <coughs> it's, um, going back to Mary Goujon's point, and uh, just point of clarification around what you mentioned, Minister, the UK government bringing forward a paper on devolved um, involvement in future trade negotiations. Is the expectation that this paper, if agreed, would lead to amendments to the trade bill? And if not, is it still the Scottish Government's position that the bill itself would need amended? Uh, can I clarify again? I didn't say involvement in trade negotiations. I said involvement in the negotiations, which are the negotiations with the EU on the future status and all the issues. And the, the issue in the paper, which the United Kingdom government is bringing forward, is the issue which has been on the table for some considerable length of time. How do the devolved administrations uh, become engaged in that process to influence that process in the areas of devolved competence? Now, we might also argue there are areas with devolved competence in which we should also be engaged. For example, I've used the example of migration, but that's what the, the paper is about. So that paper presumably will allow us to influence what happens in the negotiations, if providing the paper is agreed, um, in some way, which will, of course, then influence what the outcomes are and how those outcomes are put into legislation. So if we are aware of what is happening, if we are influencing in a genuine way what uh, is taking place and influencing the outcomes, we should be pres presumably in a better position then to ensure that any legislation or action that flows, including trade action, is influenced by our view uh, uh, and the Welsh view and hopefully the Northern Irish view. 
Thanks for that. Apologies for, for misunderstanding. Just sticking with the, the trade bill for a moment, still the Scottish Government's position that uh, the Parliament should not grant legislative consent to that. It was quite clear with the UK withdrawal bill that we would result in the place we are now of a, an alternative bill being put forward by the Scottish Government. What is the end game with the trade bill if it's not amended satisfactorily? It, it depends upon the agreement on the EU withdrawal bill because the issue is substantially the same. It is the issue of consent. If the issue of consent is resolved, that would be, I think that applies not just to the trade bill, which we have seen, but to bills which we have not seen. Because they, they will presumably, and this is presumably because we don't have this guarantee, they will presumably have two things. One is they will recognise the devolved competencies and recognise the need for consent. And they will also recognise the need for an active process of legislative consent in this parliament. So in other words, Sewell will apply. Right? So uh, the reason I have been active in the trade bill is I am not the trade minister. You know, Keith, is, Keith Brown is responsible for that, and you know, he has is taken that forward. The issue I'm engaged in the trade bill is because it is the same issue as arises in the EU withdrawal bill, and therefore we have to resolve that. And I've always said about the EU withdrawal bill, it is a gatekeeper bill. If you get that one right, then it opens the gate to getting the rest right. If you get that one wrong or there's no agreement, then you are going to have a continuing disagreement on every single piece of legislation. I can't say I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. And at that, we are out of time. Can I thank the Minister and his officials for coming to give evidence to us today? We'll now have a brief suspension before we move into private session. Thank you.